Hi, welcome to uh, the Mexico 2019 here in Cologne. Mm -hmm. um, I always ask the uh, same tough first question. Yeah. Uh, who are you and what do you do? Hi, well, I'm Hannah and Hannah Wicks and I am the Chief Marketing Officer of Ecosia.org, uh, which is a green tree planning search engine alternative. So my job is to kind of lead the communications, lead the marketing team and also direct the strategy of the company and where we're growing. Great, welcome Hannah. And I, um, so you have a search engine yeah. um, with a slightly different aim. You're finance the planting of trees. Yeah. Um, so the first question I have from what? Is it advertising revenue? How do you fund the actual tree planting uh, that is going on? Yeah, great question. So it's, there's various different revenue models we have. The core of what we're doing is from advertising revenue. Very search engines are, if you look at the top companies in the world, they are in the top number. <laughs> in terms of the revenue model, it is very successful. But our founder, Christian, his aim was, how could I take that model and instead of keeping the money and giving it to shareholders or investors, actually invest it into tree planting? So that was at the core of the idea 10 years ago when he started Ecosia. So the, the core is to uh, go through and uh, spend the money on something useful for the climate, uh, yep. society, environment, and so on. Um, but that requires you to be a good search engine as well, right? So um, I think that uh, consumers probably going to see the, the, the twist of, of uh, supporting the environment, but you still have to implement a very strong technology platform. Yep. Um, how did you build up with people like Google and others in the business? How do you build up the technology and the know-how to actually provide uh, good search results? Yeah, obviously with this, you have to invest in the product. If you don't have a product, people aren't going to use it, and then you're unable to plant trees. So in our case, we looked for partnerships that we could work with to build the technology solutions. Uh, we did have talks with Google early in the days, um, and we work with Microsoft and with other partners to provide our search results, and also to provide advertising ads on there for our users to click on and therefore to plant trees. Okay. So it's mixed. In terms of the product, we also look at ways that we can kind of build a green search engine. So give users information regarding what they're doing. And that's really our vision to what, if you are traveling, for example, how did you get to Mexico? Did you catch the train? Did you fly? So our vision is to show users how they are increasing or can decrease their carbon footprint. So instead of uh, so it's it's a much deeper model than just yeah. deflecting uh, revenue uh, yeah. towards a better cost. So um, you're you're aggregating search results from other search engines who are um, uh, I would say comparatively uh, very advanced in technology. Mm -hmm. But then within the search results, you're also adopting. Uh, in order to uh, uh, provide, um, let's say, better choices yeah. uh, in terms of the environment. Now, I think a question you get asked a lot of time uh, is uh, with uh, the Amazon on fire, with yeah. Greta uh, doing uh, her great work. Is that something you see in terms of peak in search volume of usage of your search engine? Yeah, it's a definite uh, growth driver for us. When something as tragic as the Amazon fires happen, we see users turning to us in droves. There are very few solutions out there uh, that will actually take carbon out of the atmosphere. You can neutralize. Like a person could be like, well, I'll, I'll turn vegetarian. I'll kind of switch the power over my house to green energy. I'll do all of these activities. And they're kind of mitigating, but it's not a solution. If you're planting trees, you're pulling carbon down. So when something like the Amazon fires happened, we saw by market steadily users switching to us. First, there was a huge spike of users in Brazil who were hearing about it on the day it was happening. Then it started switching over to Spanish-speaking markets and they started installing Ecosia. On one day, we saw like a growth of almost 500,000 people switching to Ecosia and that's held pretty steady. And there is a direct correlation between people caring about the climate and the situation we're facing and switching to a green search engine. And also, I think there is, there is always going to be a product gap. You have got a market leader who is investing always into their product and generating huge amounts of revenue. But with us, we do invest in the product, but we invest in the trees first. So I think it's, uh, it's also uh, the good thing. It's a relatively lazy way um, to, to do good um, by, by switching your search results over. Yeah. Um, but I think the workings behind it are very important. So when you are also starting to... Um, kind of uh, change or manipulate search based on uh, on a green profile. How do you classify that? How do you say, okay, uh, uh, can we even show uh, results for a flight from Cologne to Hamburg? Um, uh, really, I should only be showing train rides, for example. Yeah. How far can you go in terms of influencing the search results that you're showing? 
It's a good question because at the same time you want to give people freedom of choice, but I do think you have to make people aware of what is happening behind the scenes. So we've installed something, we have a little green leaf on search results and we indicate when a search is a positive. Uh, so for example, Patagonia, which is a B Corp, it has impeccable environmental credentials. If you look at for a winter jacket that you're going to need this winter, we would flag a Patagonia search result with a green leaf to indicate that that is probably the better choice for you to make. When it comes to things like travel options, we're looking at a vision where we can tell you about your carbon footprint. So we're not going to say you should absolutely do this and hide a search option from you, but yeah. we want to make sure. And pe our users are asking us for that information. They're like, I know how far it is. I know how much it costs, but what is the carbon impact? And that is something that consumers are increasingly considering. And I think if we can inform our user base, it adds extra value as well. So I think, to, uh, in short, it's a more informed consumer can make yeah. better choices in terms of the environment as well. And because I, from what, what I saw, for for example, eTribes, we're we a are consultancy, we travel quite a bit, yeah. um, and we determined our carbon footprint. I think it was a, f a spreadsheet about that long yeah. uh, in order to, to figure out what is our actual carbon footprint and what do we need to do to, to mitigate it. And I think it's an important point that you gave that, yes, you need to mitigate, but you also need to take CO2 out. Yeah. Um, and we, we uh, tried doing that with our carbon footprint in 2018 to offset it. Yeah. And we found out that uh, actually planting uh, trees is quite a complicated business yeah. because we were told, well, you can't plant trees in Germany because uh, Germany has certain uh, environmental treaties it's part of. So you need to go and support projects in the developed world to get a certified uh, carbon offset. Um, uh, and, and it sounded quite complicated. So yeah. when you plant a tree, and uh, I live on out of the countryside, I plant quite a few trees. A, you need to keep it alive, uh, yeah. so water it, protect it, um, and you need to do it in a place where the tree can continue to grow and it makes sense. And when I see your numbers, I think in one uh, one month you had over half a million uh, uh, in euros go towards planting trees. If yeah. it's, I don't know how much it costs an average on a uh, to plant a tree, but it's a lot of trees. Yeah. Um, how do you find these projects? How do you certify them? How do you make sure that the tree doesn't die? <laughs> yeah, it, it varies by project where we're choosing to plant trees. So within our leadership team, we have uh, something unique to a tech company, a chief tree planting officer. And it is his job to find the projects where we can plant trees around the world. We tend to, like you just said it, we tend to actually plant trees in biodiversity hotspots. A lot of these are on the equator line. And this is where trees can add a lot of value. So if you're planting a tree in an area where species are under threat, where the local community is seeing water dry up, that tree has a huge positive impact. For example, if we fund a lot of mangrove plantations and it's along the coastline of Madagascar and mangrove trees, if you plant them, they're relatively easy to plant and it can sequester four to 10 times the amount of carbon of an average tree. But it is very complex. So we see it as a tree planting portfolio. So always at some point in time, there is someone planting an Ecosia tree. We plant one every 0.8 seconds. But it, it varies. So in Indonesia, we're planting in a rainforest environment. And those kind of trees are very different to the trees we plant in Burkina Faso, where it's a desert style environment. But they all have different positive impacts. But you're right, it's incredibly complex. And the one thing we absolutely don't want to do is ever plant monocultures, which often end up in being chopped down very quickly for biofuel. That is not the direction we want to take. Uh -huh. And how do you, are your kind of fully integrated tree planters? So when you say we plant trees, yeah. do, you, do, you, do you actually send people there to, to do the planting or do you work with local organizations uh, that support you in, in that quest? Yeah, we work with local organizations mm -hmm. on the ground. You need to have local knowledge because like you say, you want to keep the trees there. It's all very well to plant trees, but you also want to grow those trees and you want to defend those trees. For example, in Ethiopia, the way we're funding there, we have to have almost tree shepherds, people who are watching over those trees to make sure they don't get eaten at a crucial height by a goat. Um, because otherwise, essentially, that tree's gone. And it was great that it was planted, but it's not done its purpose. Okay. So you're um, um, uh, back to the to the original business model. I think yeah. you're you're obviously in a field, uh, as you said in the beginning, there are already well established large companies mm -hmm. um, doing the same way. Did you or does your company um, think about things like uh, Smile.Amazon, where mm -hmm. essentially Amazon it gives the consumer a choice to to fund a certain uh, percentage uh, from their spending uh, towards a uh, a, a common cause or, or organization. How do the established players in the market see what you're doing? Because, I mean, for Google, uh, I guess it would be quite quite easy to integrate what you do into their search and say, look, we, we you know, we can do it. 
yes, they are public companies, so they're going to have restraints on what to do with the dividends. But um, how do they see you? Do they like you, not like you? Do they work with uh, you? Uh, what's kind of the, the feeling in the industry yeah. about what you're doing? There is strong positive feeling, uh, partly because of our user base. Our user base, 50% of them under 35, a quarter of them are 18 to 24. They skew super young. They're very engaged with these topics. And it's a good spot for advertisers to be in. Um, it's a really hard audience to access and an audience that cares and actually will look at the ads because they know that that ad could plant a tree if they clicked on it. Mm -hmm. It's a really niche spot to be in. Programs like Smile with Amazon, it's, we don't rely on donations. We rely on a very profitable business model, which we then shift the money across to tree planting. And our users know that. So there isn't a way for our users to donate. We want them to use Ecosia and that is then how we plant the trees. Okay. I think it's a it's an interesting real business model behind doing uh, doing good, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Do you see the um, uh, entire kind of charity industry, the people who work in NGOs and so on, shifting more towards that model, where where users uh, uh, get a service and they know that some of the revenue or, or most of the revenue or profits that are being generated from that are um, being driven towards um, um, a kind of uh, a public service offering, so to speak. Yeah. Um, is that something you see aside from your company developing in the industry? Do you get a lot of requests saying, hey, it's super cool what you're doing. How can I do the same? Yeah, we get a lot of requests, a lot of interest. To be honest, a lot of our partnership requests, whether they're a charity or whether it's a business, they want to switch the whole organization over to Ecosia. So the moment we have a very, very large Ecosia on campus movement and big universities, particularly in the UK, are switching over their entire network to Ecosia. We also have random organizations reaching out like the the Philharmonic Orchestra in London were like, how do we switch all of our users and our members over to Ecosia? How can we tell them about you? So a lot of the growth is happening through almost like a grass movement. I, in terms of the question about whether charities are looking for revenue, new revenue models, they definitely are. But I think actually the shift I'm seeing is businesses realizing that consumers want more than the, the company to make money. They want to know that the company is having a positive impact. They want to know that the company is ethical. They want to know that the company is running a renewable energy. And I think it's actually businesses who are realizing the value that is there for their brand and what they're doing if they start taking steps in that direction. So I think NGOs and charities have shown us a really good ground to follow. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for business to catch up. Definitely, I, say, I, I always like to look at Ben and Jerry's, for example, who yeah. ice cream flavors where uh, you have to have uh, certain uh, fruits from the rainforest that only grow in rainforest, so you have to maintain the rainforest. Yeah. I think it's uh, it's a very good way for companies to mm -hmm. do good business, but uh, also do good. I think it's uh, amazing work you do, and, uh, and, and uh, thank you very much for giving us these insights. I like to finish off my question round uh, with, with a tough one. Um, and um, you, you're also uh, helping consumers work and search differently in the digital world. Yeah. Um, and one thing we're noticing here at Demexio, when you talk to people, companies have always a big problem with uh, digitalizing and getting digital transformation right. Mm. Why do you think that is? Why, why do so many companies fail in, in digitalization? It's a question I ask everybody in the yeah. interview to get different points of views on it. So feel free to I, explore. I think it's the question of why you're doing digital transformation. If you're just doing it for the sake of it and you're like, the industry seems to be moving that way, let's do it. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it because you actually see that it could add value to your employees, that they'll have a better quality of life because they can work remotely. And you're try like, for example, they're not flying to meetings in London all the time. And rather they can do that as a video call. Not only is that going to increase their quality of life, but it also means that you're lessening your carbon footprint. So I think if, if the reason why you're doing digital transformation has a value to it, then more than just like, I think we'll make more money, like we'll have a better bottom line. Obviously that's in the mix. But if there's other reasons why you're doing that, for us, the reason we've really focused on digital transformation is because it allows us to operate more efficiently. It means our carbon footprint is smaller. And if you start seeing these other values, then I think people really get motivated because it's got to be ground up. So if the employers see the value, then I think it makes sense. I, I really like this answer because uh, I, I would fully agree. Often it's organizational structures and, and, and humans not being motivated uh, towards a common goal. Yeah. Um, I think you're doing with, uh, with your company a great way to motivate people. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. And uh, thank you very much for being with us here at uh, Cologne uh, de Mexico 2019. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.